documents. We have accomplished all the steps we need to accomplish. You are screen sharing. Okay. Very good. Now, move to. A couple of years ago I had an accident while I was kite surfing and I snapped one of the ligaments and did some serious damage to the cartilage in my knee and this meant that I couldn't walk very easily. I was on crutches, I couldn't do any of the sports that I loved. So they said that I could have an operation to reconstruct the ligaments in my knee. Now up until a few years ago this operation would have involved a stay in hospital overnight, some serious scarring. But now they use this thing called keyhole surgery. I was in and out in about five hours and I can now run, play sports, and do everything that I was doing before. It's amazing. I'm so grateful to the medical profession for the way they help me, but also for my body, the way it heals itself as well. Now all healing is ultimately from God, whether it's the medical staff using their God-given skills or the natural healing processes of the body. There have been huge advances in medicine. You know, life expectancy has more than doubled in the last 100 years. And yet, for all these advances, you look around the world and there is so much pain and sickness. And at some point in all of our lives, we come across illness or disease, whether it's ourselves or friends or family. And at that point, it's only natural to ask the question, does God heal today? I hope so, I think so. Just because I've never seen it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It could, I mean, there's there's been a lot of medical miracles. I mean, God has healed me. Still to this day, the doctors don't know what happened. Like, they, they ran tests, he healed me. Maybe sometimes less physical, but maybe he'll change your, your um, your thought process around like what you're dealing with. Yeah, I believe in miracles. Miracles? Of course, they happen every day. Absolutely. I do. Who does? We beat Russia in that hockey game, so <laughs> it must be real. Uh, I'm still here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe in miracles. I believe in fate. I believe in things that are supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I believe 100%. in that. I don't know. I don't. No, not really. I think we, we, we all destiny in our own hands. Yeah, definitely they happen. Because yeah. I want I want to believe in it. I don't believe in miracles, but I do believe in destiny. I guess I less believe in miracles, and I just kind of believe that everything happens how it's supposed to. I mean, anything is possible. Before I was a Christian, if you'd asked me the question, does God <coughs> heal today? I'd have said, that's a non-question. I don't even believe there's a God. And if there is a God, why on earth would he heal one person when there are millions of people out there who are not healed. Even after I became a Christian and I read the New Testament, I read about Jesus healing people, the disciples healing people. I thought, yeah, okay, that happened in the past, but we wouldn't expect that to happen today. Then back in May 1982, a man called John Wimber came to speak at our church. John Wimber was an American pastor, pastor of the Vineyard Church. He'd been a, a rock musician, an um, amazing guy, and he came to preach here on a Sunday night from the pulpit there. I was sitting over there. Uh, I was, I was a rather cynical about this whole subject of healing, but amazing things happened that night. The following night, we met in a room called The Spring, which is a room down there, and uh, which holds about a, a hundred people. And we had the sort of leaders of the church came. We're a much smaller church in those days, but there were about 60 or 70 leaders meeting in the spring downstairs. 
And John Wimber spoke about this whole subject of healing. And we were, we were fine with that. But then he said at the end of the talk, now we're going to have some coffee. And when we come back after coffee, we're going to do healing. Well, none of us had ever done healing before. <laughs> so we had a very long coffee break. <laughs> and when we came back after coffee, the people who'd been at the front felt it would be selfish to stay at the front. So they went, <laughs> they went right to the back. And uh, John said that he and his team had been praying, and they had various words of knowledge. And he, he explained that a word of knowledge is something that doesn't come to your natural mind. It's something that's revealed by a supernatural revelation. It could be uh, an impression, a a picture, a, some, a sort of sympathy pain, or something like that. And he said that there were uh, 12 of these. And then he read them out. And, and then he asked the people one by one <coughs> to come down. The first one, I remember, was a man who had injured his back chopping wood with an axe at the age of 14. We thought, oh, there's not going to be anybody like that. And this guy got up, and he came down to the front. And then one after another, very good friend of ours, Jeremy, uh, there was a word of knowledge about his back, and he came forward, and he received healing that night. Eventually, there was only one of those 12 words that had not been responded to. One of them was, there is a woman here who's not able to conceive. And we're British, and it was a long time ago when we really didn't talk about those things in public. And I thought, no one is going to come forward for that. But he kept waiting. And eventually, this friend of ours, young woman, got up and came forward. We didn't even know that she was struggling to conceive. But he prayed for her that night. The team prayed for her. And nine months later, she gave birth to a baby boy, although conception didn't take place in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, uh, our good friends Ed and Sarah have had five <coughs> children. And I began to look at this whole subject of healing in a different way. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says, I am the Lord who heals you. It's in God's nature to heal. God loves you and he wants you to thrive and experience wholeness. The word Jesus actually means savior. The Greek word for save is sozo. It's an interesting word because it can mean I save. Jesus came to save us from our sins, to bring us forgiveness. But the same word also means I heal. Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. And God loves to heal and he wants to use you and me to bring healing to those around us. And you are never more like God than when you are helping hurting people by wiping away their tears, helping the brokenhearted and lifting up the fallen. The Bible says our words can bring healing. Yeah, with your words you can bring healing to division, you can bring peace, encouragement, forgiveness. Most of the hurt that we experience in life comes from relationships and actually so does most of our healing. Healing comes from our relationship with God and our relationships with other people. But when the Bible is talking about healing, it's not just talking about emotional, psychological and spiritual health. There's also physical healing. 25% of the Gospels are taken up with the healing miracles of Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, we catch a glimpse of the compassion that Jesus had for people. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. But it wasn't just Jesus. Jesus gave authority to his followers, so to you and to me, to tell others the good news and to heal the sick. And it's not just for certain special people. This is for every single Christian. Jesus sent to his apostles, always telling them, preach the kingdom and heal the sick. Um, so praying for the sick people is a part of our ministry. Uh, some people uh, have a special gift, but uh, everybody can pray for, the, for sick people. Nowadays, of course, we, medicine, uh, science uh, comes to help in many, many respects. And this is uh, also a way uh, for God to, to come to our help. But <clears throat> nevertheless, people need prayer because there are many situations where medicine has nothing to say. Uh, 
and we are supposed to give hope to these persons in any situation, in any situation, because there is nothing impossible for God. And giving a person hope is sometimes is the best remedy to illnesses. We see in the book of Acts that Jesus' followers went around healing people. And as you look at church history, all the way down the centuries, that's what we see. And still today, God is healing people. It was a Friday night, and I remember in the middle of the night waking up and being quite delirious, literally spilling a glass of water in my bedroom, uh, trying to make it to the bathroom because I was going to be ill, and just not even understanding what was going on. And it was quite scary, actually. And I remember waiting till the next morning before I said to my husband, I think I should go to the hospital. I didn't realize when I went into the hospital, I would not be coming out for quite some time. I remember the doctor coming in to me and being quite severe looking, you know, very sort of serious about what he had to tell me. And he went on to tell me that I have something called fungal meningitis, and the form of it is actually called Cryptococcus gatii. And it was as strange as it sounded. A fungal ball had already um, started to grow on my brain. It was 1.3 centimeters at the base of my brain stem, and it was um, replicating itself at a really high rate. And that's the danger with this particular disease, is that uh, it gets to a point where it's big enough, which is three centimeters, that they, the only way to get rid of it is to have surgery on your brain. And no one wants that. And they told me not only would I be in the hospital for eight weeks, I would be on antifungals for two years after that. For the first three nights, I would find myself late at night at about 11 o'clock, um, lying in my hospital bed and I would just have panic attacks. I was actually having a deeply physical response to um, this knowledge that I could die. Lots of people were praying for me, lots and lots of people. And uh, I was so grateful for their prayers. I was grateful for the wonderful medical care I had. But I remember on Friday, and it happened to be Easter weekend, so Good Friday, my minister for my church offered to come in and pray with us and we accepted that invitation and he came and he prayed for me and he said I think God may want to heal you and so it was a Friday afternoon that he prayed for me and I was scheduled for an MRI on the Tuesday following I feel like I had very little faith for miraculous healing it's not because I didn't believe it was possible I just thought it would probably happen for other people it would never happen to little old me in Vancouver I went into the MRI machine and the next day I got the results and I don't think I will ever forget the day and I can see the doctor's face rushing into our room and saying are you ready to go home and Ryan and I were quite confused you know we'd sort of set ourselves up for we're here for eight weeks it was at five and a half weeks and we said yes why and he said has no one given you your MRI results we said no nobody's come in yet he said we can't find it. And I said, what do you mean you can't find it? He said, your fungal ball has completely disappeared. I can't find a trace of it. It's as if it never existed. And I said, not even the little scar on my brain? He said, nothing. It's completely gone. You can go home today. And I remember the moment because my husband just fell into my lap, laughing, <coughs> crying. I was laughing. And I said to this doctor, who I don't believe had a Christian faith like I did, I said to him, I believe God healed me. He kind of shrugged and said, I don't have an explanation. And literally, I went home that day. I have never known that kind of joy. But also, I also know that I've never experienced that depth of gratitude. Of course, not everybody gets healed. I think of a very good friend of ours, Patrick Pearson Miles. Patrick has total kidney failure. He had a kidney transplant and it didn't work. He's been on dialysis now for 25 years. No one has more faith in the area of healing than Patrick. <coughs> Patrick has prayed for so many people and many people have been healed. But he himself has not been healed although we've prayed for him so much. But I find what Patrick says is really encouraging. He says this, I have received the greatest gift, which is eternal life. 
if I get healed, that will be a bonus. When Jesus sent his disciples out and when he taught, he spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. He said, heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. The kingdom is God's sphere of influence. And one day, God's sphere of influence will be complete when Jesus returns. There are over 300 references in the New Testament to the second coming of Jesus. And when Jesus returns, everyone's going to be healed. There'll be no more sickness, no more suffering, no more pain. God's kingdom will be complete. But right now, that's not the case. We live in between the times where we're awaiting Jesus' return. And right now, not everybody is healed. The way that Paul puts it is like this. He says, right now we're groaning inwardly because we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. That's only going to happen in the future when Jesus returns. It will be the total redemption of our bodies, total healing. But what Jesus says is this. There is a future kingdom, but there's a present aspect to it right now. You can experience a foretaste of what will come in the future. Sometimes in England, after a long cold winter, we get a few really warm days in early spring when it stops raining, the sun comes out, and it feels like summer. And suddenly everyone's in shorts and t-shirts, but summer has not arrived. The next week it's freezing cold again. What we experience there is a foretaste of summer. It tells us that summer is coming. But when Jesus healed people, it was like a foretaste of the future. It tells you that one day everybody is going to be healed but right now not everyone is healed. So what about healing today? Well, if God calls you into the medical profession, then that is an amazing calling. If you look at the roots of hospitals, they often go back to Christian institutions, set up in the belief that people matter to God because they are made in his image. And God often heals people in ways that we can explain, like through the advances in medical science. <coughs> but sometimes he heals people directly in ways that we can't explain. So we shouldn't stop praying especially when the medical profession can't do any more. One time I got a call to go to the Brompton Hospital where I was the assistant chaplain. Actually, when I got the call, I was on the squash court and it was quite urgent, so I rushed to the hospital in my squash gear with my squash racket still in my hand. And when I arrived, I met the person who'd asked me to go, a, a mother called Vivian. And at first of all, Vivian was a bit surprised to see a vicar in squash gear. It took me a little bit of time to persuade her that I actually was a vicar, but when she was convinced, she asked me to go and pray for this little boy. She was a mother of three children, and she was pregnant with her fourth. The third child, Craig, he was 18 months old, and he had a hole in his heart. He'd been operated on, but it had been unsuccessful, so the doctor said that there was no hope for him. He was on life support, and three times they'd asked for her permission to switch the machine off and let him die. The mother wasn't a Christian, but she said, I want to try one last thing. I want to get someone to pray for him. So that's why I've been called. I went into the room, he had tubes all over his body, and I prayed for him in the name of Jesus to be healed. And then I went to chat to Vivian and talked to her a little bit about faith. And there in the hospital, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Two days later, I went back into the hospital to see how he's getting on, and she came running up to me, so excited. She said, after you prayed, Craig turned the corner, and he's recovered. He was healed of that heart condition. Now, that was not a placebo effect or the power of positive thinking. No way it could have been auto-suggestion. He was just a baby. That was 27 years ago. Today, Craig is still going strong kept in touch with the family all these years and he's the glue in that family, a remarkable young man. She said to me afterwards, I didn't believe, but I do believe now. Of course, I've also prayed for lots of people who haven't been healed. But as John Wimber used to say, when we prayed for no one, no one was healed. Now we pray for lots of people, some are healed. As a child, I played a lot of basketball and I think that's where the problem with my knee started and it became worse after joining the Royal Marines. The tendons were, were, were ripped, the ligaments were ripped, and as a result, my kneecap was sort of free-floating in my leg, as it were. I couldn't walk for a long period of time, I couldn't sit for a long period of time, and in itself, running was completely out of the question. I got a U-turn when I came to Alpha, 
I was, I was invited, reluctantly accepted, I must highlight. You know, very cynical about the entire thing. And then a chap said he had a word of knowledge about this young man who has this knee problem. And it's been ongoing for a long time. He needs to get it sorted. And he, if he wants prayer, he can raise his hand. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is me. Who's, who told him about it? Who told him about my knee? And I cautiously raised my hand to my ear, just, just the height. And two, two guys came over and said, do you want to go on prayer? I said, yes. And I said, I'm, I'm the knee guy. Yeah, you can say so you could pray, if you, and I really appreciate that. And they started praying for me and uh, placed his hand on my knee. And just 30 seconds, 45 seconds into prayer, there was this warmth in my knee. And then there was a tingling, which is a bit ticklish. So I started laughing. And at, at the end of the prayer, there was a slight difference. I could, I could sense there was a change. But I wanted to make, make, make sure that actually it is good to go. So I told them, step back, I need to test this. I absolutely just, just landed on my knees very heavily, like boom, on the, on the ground. And there was no pain. I just couldn't believe it. That after such a long period where I've been to top doctors, top physiotherapists in the armed forces trying to get this sorted, you know, and within three to five minutes, it's all gone. So the next day, I went for a six mile run, and in the end, I felt absolutely fine. How do we pray for healing? Well, it's God who heals and not us. So there's no need for hype or shouting, there's no technique involved. And we treat people with dignity and respect. And if they're not healed, don't tell them that it's their fault or that God doesn't love them or that God's punishing them. Jesus always prayed with love and compassion. That was his motive and it should be ours too. One of the things we've found really helpful is words of knowledge. Ask God, will you show me? It might be through a picture or an impression that you have. Sometimes you might even experience a sympathy pain. Mm, but it can feel very vulnerable both giving out these words of knowledge and responding to them. But it's been said that faith is spelt R-I-S-K. So sometimes you need to step out of your comfort zone. And when it comes to praying for someone for healing, there's always a simple model that you can use. Just check with the person whether it's okay to place your hand on their shoulder or the place that hurts where appropriate, and then pray in Jesus' name and ask the Holy Spirit to come. And sometimes you'll need to pray more than once. Jesus prayed for a man who was blind, and he said to him afterwards, can you see? And the man replied, it looks like trees walking. So Jesus prayed again, and this time the man could see clearly. So don't give up. And even if you're not healed, prayer is a great blessing. So when John Wimber first spoke here on a Sunday night in 1982, the following night we all met in church house over there. And again he spoke on healing, and again there were words of knowledge. And I was working as a barrister at the time, I was in my pinstripe suit, stiff white collar, and I was sitting in the front row so I could observe everything in great detail. And he said, uh, there is, um, there are, this is my recollection of it, he said there are 10 people here with athlete's foot. Now, I had athlete's foot, but I was not going to admit to that in, in front of all those people, or at all. Uh, and then he said, would, the, would those people like to stand, because we'd like to pray for them. Well, one by one, they stood until there were nine people standing. <laughs> I still was not going to stand. But my wife, Pippa, was sitting next to me, and she was going, that is you. And I was saying, no, 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 no. Somebody else. <laughs> but eventually, the bruising in my ribs was getting such that I felt it would be easier. Otherwise, I need to be prayed for for that as well, <laughs> to stand and to sit down. So I stood, and um, uh, one of these very nice Americans came over to me and said, um, would you like us to pray for your, your athlete's foot? I said, no, 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 thank you very much. <laughs> I said, um, actually, I quite like having athlete's foot. <laughs> it's so satisfying when you kind of rub it like that. <laughs> so he was very gracious, and he said to me, um, well, what would you like to pray for? So I said, I'd like to pray for Pa in my ministry. So he said, okay, well, we'll pray for you. And they just prayed for the Spirit to come upon me. And after a few minutes, all I can say is I experienced something like 10,000 volts going through my body. Extraordinary power of God coming. 
Uh, he, he had a fairly limited prayer, this, this, this man. Um, he just said, um, more power, every time. <laughs> was the only thing he ever prayed. I can't remember him ever praying anything else. And it, there reached a point where I could take it no longer, and I started saying, no more power. <laughs> But that didn't seem to put him off at all. He was, he was saying more power, and I was saying no more power. And eventually there was a kind of, almost a shouting match going on between us. So John Wimber, who had been obviously used to rowdy people at some of his meetings, said, uh, oh, oh, could you take that one out through them? So they carried me out, because I couldn't move. Uh, they carried me out through those French windows, and they carried me out, and out, as I was going out through the windows, I remember John Wimber saying, God is giving that person the gift of being able to tell other people about Jesus. I've often looked back to that moment because it was a very significant moment in my life. As it happened, I wasn't healed of athlete's foot at that moment, although it has cleared up since then. But I'm so glad that I was prayed for because it was an amazing experience. And since then, Pippa and I have tried to tell people about Jesus and to bring healing wherever we can. I try to pray for people like I was prayed for because I believe that God uses us today to heal people. He wants to use you to heal people. I encourage you to be someone who brings healing in your family, among your friends, in your workplace, in your community. Praise for the sick. Binds up the brokenhearted wipes away people's tears, lifts up the fallen, breaks down division, and brings healing wherever you go. In Jesus' name. Okay. <laughs> First impressions, initial thoughts. I think you can't you can't think that whoever you pray for, everybody's gonna get the healing that you pray for. Um I went through this probably for about three quarters of a year just recently. Uh, somebody's sister-in-law, uh, the cancer came back. And I kept praying for her if it was in God's plans to heal her. And about two weeks ago, um, the person's sister-in-law uh, got news from them that she was, she's cancer free. So it was in his plan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I think sometimes God uses somebody's sickness or ailment and they don't heal completely, but I think God uses that to bring others to him so that they can start praying for someone. Mm -hmm. Has anyone had that type of experience where you've been given a diagnosis and then it's not there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. I got a phone call maybe four years ago. I had some tests done and I got a phone call saying that I probably need to connect with an oncologist because there was some spots on my lung. So I got an oncologist and they did another set of CT scans. And in the meantime, I had contacted some people that I know were strong prayer warriors. And when I met with this oncologist, he said, we've seen your results. We saw before and after, but the after shows there's nothing there. And I 
And I just kind of looked at him and I go, well, where did it go? What do you mean there's nothing there? There was something there before. Um, I just said, well, the power of prayer really works. Mm -hmm. So I believe that's really true too, because in my situation, um, I did have cancer and I had people like all of you that were praying for me. And I had people that I knew sort of that wrote to me or called me and said, I'm praying for you. And some of them I had no idea were even prayer people or believers. And I believe that collectively with all those prayers and with the medical assistance that I got, um, it took a while, but um, I'm in remission now. And uh, I can't be more grateful to the people that prayed for me and the medical people that performed their magic. <laughs> um, that together, it just, you know, it made me whole again. For myself, like I had mentioned before, how the doctors had told me I had no medical intervention. You're never going to have a child. I had a lot of surgeries. I had a lot of scarring. I had a lot of issues. And they said, you will not. It's sorry, but you, can, you cannot conceive a child. And I just thought, okay, two or more are gathered in your name, dear Lord. You will answer our prayers one way or another. And um, I would go to church. So many times, and just, just like I was doing here when I needed prayer, just come in and just sit in the church um, and just take in everything that God could give me. And through the power of prayer, you know, and Greg and I have Nick. So, you know, it's, um, I do believe in miracles. And I have so many scars and wounds still all on my body. And I just feel like, you know what? I give it up to God every minute of the day, every minute of the day. Um, and I just know that somehow, some way things will work out. And like you, you said, Bernie, right away that, you know, it's not, everything's not going to be answered and it's not in our timing. And, you know, um, sometimes I even think like, oh, I only wish I could be a grandmother right now. You know, I appreciate and love hearing the stories of people here when you're with your grandchildren. And, um, you know, it's not the right time for Nick right now, of course, but it's also not the right time for even me. I wouldn't be able to even hold a grandchild in my arms. So I know strength will come and the time will come one way or another. It doesn't, I enjoy other people's grandchildren too. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, I do believe in the healing like that. Mm -hmm. Well, God's ways are not our ways. That's right. Absolutely. But definitely prayer is powerful. Amen. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> For sure. My second son was born as a preemie. We had three with one and going down to two nine. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Lots of prayers were sent. Oh, now he's 42 yeah. years old. <laughs> so, got him through it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who were healed and uh, and that there were people praying for them you know, for healing and, and I've experienced that myself as well. Um, I um, I used to have very severe PMS and for two weeks out of a month. I was in extreme pain, yeah. and so I had a gynecologist at the University of Chicago do a laparoscopy because we're trying to figure out what's causing this and one of the side things that came up was that um, he saw a, a growth about the size of a quarter that was growing through <laughs> into my back muscle and so that was something he couldn't treat or do anything about and so I told my uncle and my old prayer group that he took that prayer intention to um, you know, my uh, former prayer community and uh, they prayed for me, and uh, when I 
met with a gynecologist again, you know, I, I asked him about it and he says, well, it's gone, it's not there. So, and I was feeling a tug at my, my back, you know, before, and um, I wasn't, you know, that, that was gone. And, and there was a, a complete healing. But, um, my dad has had healing and um, one of the ladies in, um, that I learned about uh, through ministry, she had in Williams, was, uh, had a brain tumor and was pretty good size, but she prayed for, you know, for healing and, and that, you know, told God, you know, that she would, would minister, you know, want to serve him. So she did, she had a house in Kimwood, Oakland, one of the really bad neighborhoods in Chicago at the time. And uh, she left her door open at all times so that, you know, people knew there was, there was, if they wanted anything, they could have it. And there really wasn't anything, uh, you know, of, uh, 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 you know, that, you know, of real value to, to steal. And so she lived for quite, quite a long time afterwards. And she had a lot of seminarians come and work with them, Shalom Ministries. And um, there was a group out there, Shalom Ministries in Gary, as well as uh, there in Chicago. And a lot of the mission students were taught there. A lot of the mission. So uh, God was very gracious and powerful and an amazing healing. <clears throat> well, our youngest, my nephew in India, his little boy, uh, when he was in his mom's womb, they diagnosed him with spinal bifida. And she had people telling her she should have an abortion and so on and so forth. Well, She's a good Catholic girl, and she also didn't do it because we just kept saying so, you know. And uh, so Tommy, uh, when he was being born, my sister-in-law called and said they'd have Sue up and they're taking, you know, they're taking the baby. I said, okay. So as soon as I hung up, I looked up and said to my husband, Ronald, you take care of our boy. And I got a phone call that said, Tommy's born and he's kicking because we had been told that he was going to end up in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Well, that young man is now going to be, uh, he's a sophomore, he's going on his junior year and he's bound and determined he's going to go to, to uh, Purdue where his siblings went. And he also uh, is going to be a broadcaster for the Chicago Cubs. Nice. He's an awesome child. He's a miracle. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the experience of healing. We we don't have to cast a very very wide net to pull in a lot of experiences that we have had of, of healing in our lives. And I, I suspect there are a lot of other experiences that people are just, you know, not verbalizing right at the moment. A couple of things that kind of caught my attention in the, the video that I'll throw out there is starting points for discussion. Um, one that they talked about a little bit was this whole notion of there is so much pain and suffering in the world, even among faithful people, you know, even when Jesus was in, in Galilee doing his ministry, some people got healed, but not everyone got healed. And um, you know, I've always kind of understood that as similar to what the presenter said, this notion of the healing is is a sign of God's kingdom. When God's kingdom is fully realized, that's going to be normal. God's kingdom has started to put down roots. It has started to grow, but it is not fully established. So I think these healings that we see in our lives, it is a result of living in that 
kind of in between time, between the time when Jesus has gotten it started, but not yet the time he has come back to finish the work. And I think that connects with me to that verse out of Luke where they said, um, you know, go, you are healed, know that the kingdom of God is near. The reason the kingdom of God near is the healing. That's, that's why the kingdom is near. It's because they've experienced what is going to be a part of that. Um, I think the link between healing and wholeness. So, of course, when in Hebrew they use the word shalom, it's not just everybody's put down their weapons and people have stopped fighting. But it's that notion of everything being everything firing on all cylinders. You know, the creation is meant to support, each part is meant to support another part. So shalom is really that, that well-being for all the pieces. So when we talk about healing, yeah, of course it's physical, but it's also all the other things we need to be, to be whole, to be, have well-being. Um, I know sometimes <laughs> people will say, Oh, you know, it's in God's hands now, or all we can do is pray. And that's usually as a last resort. But remember, for, for people of faith, we, we should start there. It's in God's hands. Well, is there a better place for it to be? Um, and, uh, you know, someone over here had said, you know, can God use that illness? And I would argue that uh, the Apostle Paul sure thinks so. Uh, he seems to have had some sort of... Uh, chronic illness and he prayed to God to take it away and God said no nope, because you're going to understand that um you know even in your weakness my power is is enough my grace is sufficient for you um so God used that and um I also jotted down in my notes here that you know even faithful people who are uh, sick and suffering, and people have mentioned the, the combination of prayer and medicine. And uh, I know there are people who will say, "Well, no, I don't. I don't believe in this medical thing because God's going to take care of it." Um, and the first thing I wrote down was uh, for for those who have studied Latin, um, we do we do not <laughs> believe in a God who operates on the principle of do ut des, which is Latin for "I give." in order that you might give. We do not work with a transactional God. Like if I rack up so many grace points, God will give me some good stuff. Um, now that defeats the point of grace. So it's not, and I think very often people succumb to that thinking, like, well, you know, so-and-so was such a good faithful person. They went to church every week and, you know, dug 50 wells in a small African village and this and that. And they still got cancer. You know, what's up with that? Those things are not related to each other. Um, we, we live in a, a fallen and broken world, and that brokenness extends even to our bodies. Um, and and I, I have told people regularly, if you think that people God works through are automatically guaranteed, like all the good stuff, you know, they're going to be healthy and not have to suffer anything like that. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. God was not, God has chosen no one more than God has chosen Jesus. And Jesus did not have an easy go of it. And I, I regularly go back to Jesus being, being tempted and, and uh, when people talked about that combination of, of God working through prayer, but God also working through people who have skills and gifts for healing, um, you know, God, God doesn't want us to discount the ways that God has showed us that we can work in the world, you know. Um, and I keep going back to Satan taking Jesus up to the top of the temple and saying, well, if you're God's son, throw yourself off the temple. You know, you deserve special treatment from God. Let's, let's see what happens. And as I've said before, Jesus does not say, all right, watch this. 
Jesus understands that part of the way the world works is if you step off the top of a building, you will plummet to earth. If the building is tall enough, like the temple was, you will not get back up. And so I, I really struggle when people will say, no, 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 I, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to rely on, on medicine for this because God's going to take care of it. God, God is going to take care of it. Maybe God is taking care of it through putting you in the hands of people who have gifts and skills for healing. Well, and I believe too that God gave those people the gifts and the intelligence and the skills that are needed in medicine to help. Those, mm -hmm. you know, those are God-given talents too. So, to know how much to give you to figure out right you know right the tests that were developed yes i agree with you that, that is true and i've given up numerous things to the medical profession to take care of me and a half however when i was pregnant because of my age being 38 um trying to think in the name of the test that they want to test you for uh, if your child's got down syndrome and they said, well, the issue with that is because of your age and your previous medical conditions, um, you can have a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So again, Greg and I went to our pastor, Pastor Hansen, and we prayed on it. And I decided I'm not going to have the medical test. I'm giving it up to God. And, um, and that was a big decision. I mean, there's a lot of people that would say, oh, you know what, then, you know, you could have just tried again. Well, we couldn't try again. This was this was it. And I just thought, you know, luckily enough for me, it was a blessing that I then many years later worked with Down syndrome students at Kaler and um, the love and, and what they give you is so much. So it didn't matter how our child was. It was our child. And I was giving it up to God that it was going to work out. And, and it did. But yeah, the medical profession, the doctors were really against me. Uh, not having the test. And I just thought, you know, that's our own personal choice. And I believed it was going to work out one way or another. Everything was going to be fine. So I didn't always trust them. I trusted the Lord. Yeah. He trusted us. I guess, I guess he trusted us enough that no matter what our child, however our child was, we were going to still love and take care of him. Yeah, and where that, I don't think it's a real clear dividing line, you know, God's over here and science is over here. No, that, that, that's not how it really works. But one of the interesting places where that line gets blurred is many of us have probably dealt with some people in the medical profession who are confused on that basic tenet that we iterating here so often, God is God and you're not. Does anybody come across those, those people? So I do well, find my, yeah, I had an experience with my mom that before surgery, as you were saying, the doctor said the doctor initiated a prayer. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. was, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do feel compelled to let people know that at our Wednesday service a week from tonight, we will be doing laying on of hands and anointing for healing. So if people are into that sort of thing, come join us. And as some of you know, when I come to visit, I usually will bring my anointing oil, which I like because it's a, it's a tangible and olfactory aspect to the prayer. Um, in addition just to the, the spoken word, but it, mm -hmm. it, it, it literally sticks with you longer. <laughs> Especially because I use the nice myrrh scented in my table. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done frankincense. Frankincense is a little more piney, so it might oh, smell like you. Yeah. might smell like you've been yeah. cleaning with pine salt or something. <laughs> 
we're in a Catholic church. Very strong smell in the Catholic yeah. churches. Funeral oh, yeah. cities. Almost makes your eyes water oh, like goodness. you're sitting up front. Mm -hmm. Well, like I've said before, if it was up to me, we'd be burning incense every day. Not everybody is down with the incense. Other thoughts? I think it also takes a strong faith when prayers are not answered mm -hmm. when we don't see um, a resolution to what is going on. Mm -hmm. That even sometimes takes a stronger faith, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, um, before this last treatment I had, I was talking to the doctor and it's like, well, you know, what am I, what's my life look like? Do I do this every six months so I can be upright again for a while and then six months later do it again. Cause it's, um, gosh, I've been doing this for a long time. But then he said, you've been doing this for 15 years, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> like, yeah, I guess so. I guess this looks like my life, but I don't know. It's so good to see you here. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We don't care if you have to lay down and <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes we got kind of jealous. I still have a map there. <laughs> you know, it might be your life, but you have to feel grateful too for what it's doing. Well, I mean, I've changed a lot. Gosh, I was in 2009, I was pretty much comatose and unable to do anything, unable to get out of bed. Didn't even know what was going on. So I suppose you could say I was comatose. Uh, dumb, so there's a lot of improvements since that time, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we want to look at? Look at our handout here. You know, what does God promise to do in terms of healing? Because I, I think one of the things we want to be clear on is exactly that question: What does God promise to do? Because I think that is the rock that many people's faithfulness can founder on if they are assuming, well, if the assumption is, if I am good enough, God will heal me, and then they don't get healed, then either they go, well, I guess I'm not good enough, or they go, well, God is just not, not all he's cracked up to be. What is our sense of what God promises? I've heard this so many times. You know, there must be an unresolved sin that you haven't repented of. It must be, you know, something that I was doing wrong that caused illness. And that's just absurd. That doesn't, when Jesus was here, he didn't heal everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he didn't heal everyone, but he has his reasons. But, I mean, it, that doesn't mean he's reason. not with us. No, I mean, he can know, use any with the individual. Well, like with Paul, he can use illness to his glory, too. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that Paul's illness was never revealed allows us all to identify with him. Mm -hmm. You know, what did he have? Did he have gastrointestinal problems? Did he have back problems? Did he have, you know, neurological problems? We could, because we all go through health problems who can identify with Paul because we were never told what we had. And I think that was just brilliant to not tell us what, what Paul had because if we had been told, um, we all wouldn't be able to identify with him. Mm -hmm. But God promises to be with us regardless of what the problem is or how it ends. And I think we just have to trust it. Mm -hmm. I think that that is a, a bedrock foundational promise to remember is that no matter how good or bad things are going, that is not an indicator of God's presence or absence. Mm -hmm. um, 
last week when I was in Crawfordsville, one of our presenters was talking about John 10. And Jesus says, I came that, my, that God's people might have life and have it abundantly. And the presenter has done a lot of work in inner city neighborhoods has said, we often forget that abundant life is not limited just to when we have prosperity and you know relative peacefulness and progress in our lives. Abundant life is happening in the midst of, of good things and bad things happening. So yeah, that, that idea of, you know, that's that's Matthew's gospel in a nutshell. You know, what is Jesus all about? He's God with us. He doesn't say God with us under the following conditions. These are the signs you can tell God is there. You are smarter, happier, prettier, richer. Did I already say healthier? <laughs> yeah. So that's not, um, yeah, God is right. Well, that's the problem with the prosperity gospel. It's so abundant these days that it equates prosperity with God's favor. Yeah, and it's a really complicated. Yeah, it's it's a really complicated not to unwind because there are plenty of places where God spells out part of the way God promises blessing is, you know, you will have a lot of material stuff. Sometimes God will say, you know, your flocks will be abundant, your crops will be bumper crops. God does say that, but all throughout scripture, you have God being with the people who don't have that. You know, God does not choose Egypt. God does not work through the branch of the family where people already have a dozen children. He works through Abraham and Sarah. Um, so, yeah, it's a complicated and and complex thing but I, I think I think a lot of people who who push the prosperity gospel probably don't read out of the prophets very much um just kind of shunt that to the side um well we have to, they were all except for John all the um, disciples were tortured and killed it doesn't Oh, God, that's a problem. It doesn't guarantee you the easy life. Mm -hmm. it may, in fact, yep. be more yep. difficult. Mm -hmm. And he has his reasons. I mean, it, he hasn't promised that we're going to get everything. Mm -hmm. And even, even though we may pray for somebody to be healed or um, you know, whatever, he doesn't totally promise that either. Yeah, he never promised us a rose garden. That's right. Yeah. There's thorns on those roses. It's more for our generation. <laughs> I know uh, that song. <laughs> but uh, other thoughts, I have, I'm just... Uh, I, I think because that that understanding is so pervasive, this idea of you no, know, if I'm holy enough, God'll God'll do this. And I think sometimes I, I know it is not this simple, but I think sometimes people people view it as being this simple. People people might make a vow. Uh, and I have family members who have done this. They've had a, a health problem and they will make the promise, God, if you heal me, I'm going to go on this pilgrimage. And, you know, the person who prayed for that, you know, with the help of, of a surgeon was healed. And he went on the pilgrimage. And I, I don't, I don't get the sense that it's done with the idea of, I'm going to buy God's, buy God's healing, you know, by offering to do this, this good work. I don't think that's how it probably originated, but I think sometimes the, 
the foundation, the theological foundation is maybe not made clear to folks um, all the time. So you can't bargain with God. Mm -hmm. And I think some people think they can. Mm -hmm. Well, Abraham did. But, but. <laughs> I'm just saying mo most of us <laughs> most of us don't have quite the, the the wherewithal to get in God's face the way Abraham did. Um, but I, I think it I think even Abraham would understand that he could bargain with God because of grace, because God invited him into that relationship first. Um, as we've said before, and we, we studied um, Judaism, there's stories in Islam, there's traditions about why God chose Abraham. Um, but if we're going just with what the Bible says, God spoke to Abraham. You know, it's, it's grace. Yeah, I was just thinking um, also when you spoke about the pilgrimage, a pilgrimage is an outward um, seeking, you know, God in the holy. And at the same time, interiorly, there's work going on. And so you know, this patient who had need and prayed to God in this way was opening up to God even more, you know. Right. So if this is your will. And I think that in the same thing with Abby Williams, um, who headed up Shalom Ministries in Kimwood, Oakland, that was her thing too. You know, if it was her time to go, that was fine. But if you, you know, if you will, right, you know, this is what I would like to do. I yeah. want to be closer to you. I want to serve you. Yeah. More. More. That you know, I I like that better than. You'll really like it, God. <laughs> well, the Bible makes it clear that there's lessons to be learned in suffering, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Many times we wish there were other ways to teach those lessons, but yeah. sometimes there's not. Yeah. There can also be other teaching, in fact, like with, with Jane, the Lord has given you the strength to make it through all these years and what you've gone through, but how is science advanced because of studying you, you know? Yeah. Have, you know, because they've learned a lot. They've learned sure. a lot from her. Jane's one of those people who's had the doctor say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, come in here. I've never seen this before. <laughs> not in how many times are they talking and discussing and what can we do, you know, not in front then, of Jane, but I mean them. And then others have been helped. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Well, there's been big changes over the years. Healing. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Insights? I think we may still have like a third of a pot of coffee left. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I said, next Wednesday night, uh, we'll do healing as a part of worship. And certainly if, if people are ever in want or need of prayer for healing, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor. That's, that's part of what I do. So don't, don't feel, don't feel weird calling and asking. I'm happy to Pray with you for healing in person. So that's not a, I want everybody to know that. And I will also say this. People somewhat regularly will call and say, hey, I've got blank going on. And I'll say, you know, I wish you would have told me about this, you know, six weeks ago when it started. And people will say, I didn't want to bother you. I tell people, when you've got something going on and you need someone to pray for you or just to listen to you, that's, that's not bothering me. That's that's the work God has put in my hands. So please, mm -hmm. please never think that you are bothering me by calling to say, I got this going on. Um, so please, please do not think that people say, oh, you're so busy. I'm like, oh, we're all busy. But <laughs> if, if I'm going to visit you, 
or even if we're just spending some time on the phone talking about what's going on in your life, that's making me busy, but that's part of what I do. That, that is my work. So when I'm out visiting you, when I'm talking on the phone, when we're spending time together here, that, that is my work. You're not keeping me from doing my work. I'm doing my work. So um, you're, any group within the church will hear me when I say that. It is all y'all who are gathered here. So. I can't, say <laughs> I can't say thanks enough, Pastor, for the time to take your door open here. Well, I'm glad to do that. Yes, if the door is open, come on in. If the door is closed, you probably don't want to be in there. But yeah, if the door is open. Wait for a different time, in other words. <laughs> You know, I want to just comment on Sunday morning when I came in and that young man was playing the organ. Yes. I'm telling you, I was so, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Our Victor is just. <laughs> it, it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. And everybody's running to another ship. Is that Victor? Is that Victor? And they're running around trying to get to each other to find out for sure because you were busy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was definitely the proud dad. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was just amazing. Totally so. yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Well, I am yeah. glad to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Even if I am the fourth most popular member of my family. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. And that's okay. The other members of my family are a lot more lovable than me. But... Uh, Although now that my, my parents are here, I don't know if I've dropped down to six. <laughs> I'll stop there. Can we close our study this morning, praying the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for being here. If you did not get an Easter basket, please grab the Easter basket. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We will be